You don't have your glasses. You're, oh, Marlene, she's a really good reader. Go, oh, Marlene. She sounds like a, I, she sounds like a professional reader. So you're reading um, chapter five, right to verse fourteen. Okay. So that and that. So Acts five, and it, the chapter is titled Ananias and Sapphira. Mm -hmm. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, An Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, how come you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in and, finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. The apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. Thank you. Amen. I love gifts in the uh, in the body of Christ. Aren't they beautiful? Isn't she a beautiful reader? Um, yeah, and I just wanted to say Hilk did a really, really good job. So I'm I'm just happy that when we do go, you'll be in good hands. Grace and Hilk will be uh, feeding the flock, so I know it'll be good. And sometimes it's just good to have something different. Do you ever go to somebody's house and it's like such a different style of food? And it's just really wonderful to have a change. Amen? So um, when I asked the Lord, so God, what am I doing with <laughs> with that? I asked the Lord on Sunday, which I is my time. I usually like to get my bare bones on Sunday after dinner. And the Holy Ghost said, it's the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord. Well, what is the fear of the Lord? Some of us think of, oh, are we supposed to be afraid of God? And it's not that at all. It really is a part of the Holy Spirit. When you have Jesus on the inside, uh, his Holy Spirit comes on the inside, right? And so what is the fear of the Lord is standing in reverential awe of God, of I just think of the when I first became born again, I was in awe because of the love of God. I really couldn't believe uh, what I was experiencing, this awesome love of God, because I wasn't cleaned up yet, and I was, I was still very aware of my messed up life and my messed up thinking and my habits and all kinds of stuff that was wrong with me. But it, there was this overwhelming love of God. 
And that's what I, I think we have to start with. We have to start out with being in awe of who God is. His, of having awe and respect and um, knowing his love and the all-encompassing it's like a many-faceted diamond. There's so much to God. How do you put him in one word? That's why he's got a, a thousand different names. So um, I don't know quite how the fear of the Lord uh, got on the inside of me, but even before I was born again, I had this real sense of an ever-present God. He's omnipresent. And I was always, you know, it's one thing to sing about, oh, we want to be filled with your presence, the tangible presence of the Lord. But I also was very aware of his presence when I was trying to sin. And I don't know if it was the prayers of my mother or what, or I don't know how all to describe it. But there was a good healthy fear, sort of like... uh, when you get caught doing something good, you, it's nice, right? When you're doing a surprise for somebody and they walk in, you go, wow, thank you so much. But there's also that if you did something uh, that wasn't so good, and I was sharing this with Gil, because I used to help my dad in the garden. He was a real garden or a great big garden, vegetable garden and everything. And he would love when I'd come to help him and just be there. But I was a little bit... Uh, rough with his plants which didn't go over so good so when I helped him pick beans there was a few times I went to grab never mind picking one bean at a time if you're sanguine and there's lots you just grab a handful of beans I don't know if you've ever done that before and give it a good yank and the whole plant would come out and I remember that trying to stuff the roots back in before my dad saw so you just get this uh I knew my dad loved me, but there was also a real sense of not displeasing him, and I would sense, I would describe the fear of the Lord in that way. When you love somebody, you don't want to hurt them. You want, you respect them. You stand in awe of who they are, and that's, you know, it causes us to love God and exalt Him and know His holiness. And so, what's the opposite of the fear of the Lord. And that would be thinking lightly of, of it, taking somebody for granted, not knowing God's character, who he is, that he is worthy of our praise. And there's so many people uh, I feel like have ditched their shipwreck, their faith, because they don't have a good, healthy fear of the Lord. I believe this place would be crowded this morning if people had a a true fear of the Lord, the spirit of the fear of the Lord. In Isaiah 11, it talks about uh, the spirit of the Lord that would come on Jesus. And it's the spirit of wisdom and insight, understanding, counsel, might, and the fear of the Lord. And it says of Jesus, he would delight in the fear of the Lord. So it's not a thing that we dread. It's a thing that we delight in. We delight to honor him. We delight to esteem him. We delight to reverence him, to give him the glory and the awe, do his holy name. Amen. So that matters in the body of Christ. Why does that matter? Without the fear of the Lord, uh, nothing can go right. We don't have a full, we're not embracing uh, all of who God is. And so I think that's why Holy Spirit wants to go there. It is speaking of the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's not just um, it's so many times, yeah, we, we um, think of it in a negative way, the fear of the Lord. So uh, my title of my message is Embracing the Spirit of the Fear of the Lord. Embracing. Why do we embrace Well, it's something we choose. We choose the fear of the Lord. If we choose Jesus, we choose all of who he is. We don't we don't just get part and parcel. We don't we can't really embrace all of who he is and come into a fullness of relationship and experience everything else of God if we if we ignore the fear of the Lord. 
Amen. So we have to value and esteem and exalt the Holy Spirit if we want him to manifest, if we want to see the fullness of his power, if we want to see what he was doing in the book of Acts, if we want to experience that in our churches today, we need to embrace the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And so hopefully, once you see the expounding of God's word on that, you will choose and embrace the spirit of the fear of the Lord. So the fear of the Lord, it causes us to examine our hearts. That is uh, my second point. First, why embrace? And then it enables us to examine our hearts. What if Ananias and Sapphira had the fear of the Lord? What if they embrace the fear of the Lord? What if they examined their heart? And you can't tell me that they talked about doing this and did this, and hours later, the whole plan, without the Holy Spirit nudging. How many are aware when the Holy Spirit nudges you? You say something in a little bit of a attitude, a little bit too curt, a little bit not sweet, and Holy Spirit is like, Lord, I can't believe I did again. That could have, I could have said that a little nicer or whatever. But can you imagine? Have you ever lied? I remember the first time I lied. I was six years old doing my homework, doing something at the round table that's now in our kitchen, round table, and my mom had this African violet. And I was just kind of curious. As a child, I was very curious. And I was just feeling the softness of the petals. And then I noticed they were really nice and squishy, those little leaves. And then before I knew it, I was kind of pinching them with my fingernail. And I was just sitting there, getting lost in this African violet, experimenting, a very tactile child. And before you know it, it, yeah, a few hours later, it was sort of brownish. You could see where every little finger nail had been. And my mom's going, oh, who touched my African violet? She had something about African violets. Well, the way she said it just, there was such a fear that came into me. I just didn't say I didn't do it, but I didn't tell her I was the one. And the feeling I had, that supper table, it was just horrible. That was my first experience of trying to get away with a lie, like not being up front with my mom. And, and it's a horrible feeling. Do you, ever, do you remember when you did wrong things and you just had that horrible feeling so i think of the fear of the lord examine it causes us to examine our heart but it's it's a horrible feeling when we know we haven't been truthful and you can't tell me that ananias and sapphira didn't feel the holy spirit god had been moving for chapters <laughs> He had been moving for days. He had been moving for weeks. He had been in his manifested presence. They had seen the signs and wonders. So the fear of the Lord is our is a good thing. It's our friend. It's on our side. Holy Spirit's trying to help us to, to not go astray. Amen. And so he nudges us. So the fear of the Lord is something that we want to embrace, and it causes us to examine our hearts. Why? So not that we get caught red-handed. It's so that we won't, every sin lands up, ends up in death. So we want to, this, uh, a beautiful friend of ours, the fear of the Lord, the spirit of the fear of the Lord. He is the Holy Spirit. And the fear of the Lord makes examples here, God writes her names right in the Bible. Of all the things that are happening, signs and wonders and miracles and people getting healed and even shadows, uh, healing people as they went about, here's their names in the middle of that. Would you want to wreck your book by putting somebody's names? You want to just sweep it under the carpet, but don't hear their names forever and ever and ever. They're going to be remembered 
Remember Ananias and Sapphira. I don't think you could say that in any church and somebody not know who Ananias and Sapphira is. Like, yeah, aren't they the ones that died because they lied? It's like, yep. And God uses them as examples. And I, where is it? 1 Corinthians 10, 11 says, these things were written as a warning to us. As a warning. They're written so that there's a warning it's like those boundary lines have fallen in pleasant places. Why are they pleasant? Because they keep us from going into the ditch, right? So these boundary lines, it's like they, these things were written. And so we see the fear of the Lord. The Bible's full of people that went shipwrecked and their names are right out there. It's like, so don't do this and don't be like that and careful for that. And that's to help us. It's not, again, so that, oh, we found you guilty. It's, it's written for our help to keep us on the straight and narrow. And so I'm thankful that there are examples in the word, right? Because Holy Spirit will literally uh, say to us at times, careful, you know what that happened to David when he got that or, or whatever. All these examples are written in the word for us as a warning. And so I'm thankful for that. We never live long enough to make all of the mistakes ourselves, so thank the Lord we can learn from the examples of others, can't we? And not just in the Bible, but we can say, okay, look what happened to them when they're just not being careful in there. God's word is very specific about that, and, and so we want to be careful about it. Next, God puts these things as to keep us from not just being experts in God's goodness, but also not um, falling for the, the ensnarement of legalism. So, you know, the fear of the Lord, we need this balance. And I think in the body of Christ, many people have come out of maybe religion where there was the ensnarement of legalism, right? Boy, oh boy, if you got... I grew up in a church where we didn't go to fill our cars up with gas. We didn't get milk on that day. We did not go to the store. And we went to church, and there were certain things. My friend even couldn't even ride her bike on Sunday. That's called legalism. You don't want to fall into that ensnarement of legalism. But I think the church has swung so far the other way where we're just so, we become experts at the goodness of God, the love of God, we're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, and so there's been no fear of the Lord. And I forget some of the names of, I know there's a big history in my time of being a pastor where I've heard so many people, another one bites the dust, another one bites the dust, and just recently, this last year, Bruxy Cavey, and there's also, um, we were listening to someone on the radio who's on every single Sunday on our Ravi Zach Christ, and I just going, how does that happen? For years, these, this was going on. And meanwhile, they're on national television and on the radio every single Sunday. And how does that happen? Maybe because we've been such experts at the love of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God, the compassion of God, but the experts, but now no fear of the Lord. How could people take money from their church and use it for all kinds of things personally? How could these ministries fall after... How could they do that? It's because they don't have the spirit of the fear of the Lord. That it, we live in the presence of God. He said, Jesus said, he comes everywhere we go. I'll never leave you or forsake you. Your spirit dwells within us. And we don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. If you love him, if you love him, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey me. Is that right? So how important is embracing the spirit of the fear of the Lord? 
It's not about how long we can fool other people. That's a different point. Here we are. And it causes us to exalt the Lord in Isaiah 33. I want to read that for you. Isaiah 33, 5 and 6. So beautiful. It causes us to exalt the Lord. The Lord is exalted for he dwells on high. He will fill Zion with justice and righteousness. He will be a sure foundation for your times, a rich store of salvation and wisdom and knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the key to all these treasures. The fear of the Lord is the key to all these treasures of salvation of righteousness, of justice, of knowledge. It's all in him. See, and it can't be separated. We can't categorize. It all comes from him. The fear of the Lord is the key to these treasures. You can't, so then, let's break it down. You can't get saved without good, healthy fear of the Lord. Just like at the end of this chapter, many people feared they didn't want to come in with insincere hearts. After that happened, could God who sees the hearts of all men and he examines the hearts of all men. Amen? And so uh, you can't get saved without a good healthy fear of the Lord. To say, I'm giving my heart and my life to Jesus. I'm getting all of him. Now he's moved on the inside, a spirit of truth. A spirit where I can't, I might fool some of the people some of the time, but I can't fool God any of the time. Amen? That is a good, healthy fear of the Lord. Wisdom, knowledge comes from him. The fear of the Lord. Why study the word? Why memorize the word? Why get knowledge? Why get wisdom? Why all these treasures? Why do we love justice? It's all in the fear of the Lord. Because someday we know we will stand and give an account. Amen? So these are classified as treasures. They're treasures. They'll keep you from going the wrong path. All of these things are treasures. So they cause us to exalt and magnify like, wow, God. Like, wow. And we have lost the wow in our churches. We have lost the wow in our lives. Why? Maybe because we don't have the key, the master key that opens all the treasure boxes of the Lord. Amen? They're all what is that key? The key to all these treasures is the fear of the Lord. So again, it causes us to exalt the Lord. And the fear of the Lord causes us to ex esteem the Lord. We will either esteem the Lord and, and make him big and exalt him and magnify him, or we're going to esteem our own egos. And in Ananias and Sapphira's part, it was all about ego. Somebody else saw a sold land and gave it at the apostles' feet. And hey, here was an opportunity to exalt and maybe one-upmanship, who knows what, we don't know. But obviously it wasn't about esteeming the Lord, it became about esteeming themselves, making themselves look bigger, look grander, maybe it was worth more. And I just want to have us meditate a little bit on that, because being a little bit, being mercy-motivated person, I just kind of think, I wonder how that actually played out. Maybe it was like real estate these days. They have an asking price, but that's somebody really wanted that property. And maybe they offered 100000 more than that. Doesn't make sense these days. The real estate world's really gone screwy. It's like, why are they asking 500000 and then it's going for 800000 But anyways, that's, that's not what this is about. But he, I was just trying to imagine, how did this look? Because it's just like, maybe, you know how the enemy, he's, he's like a snake. Amen. He comes, like Gil said, rob, kill, and destroy. So maybe it wasn't like, oh, man. We want to look better than him. What are we going to do? Maybe not. Maybe they just said, wow, we got more than we thought. Oh, well, well, that's what we thought we were going to get, so we'll just do that. However it played out, 
Uh, we got to be aware of the snares of the enemy, don't we? We have to be so, the Bible says, we're not ignorant of the devices of the enemy. And just like we know, I'm sure all those hours and those days that passed, they were feeling it. They probably couldn't sleep. There was probably, I don't know, there's something, that just doesn't sound right, right? I'm sure there was a conviction going on. But we have to be careful, too, that we're not, uh, what is esteeming our own ego. That could come as a temptation, right? We have to be aware of that snare. Well, once Hilk preaches, they won't want to listen to you. Well, you know, I'm just th- fooling around here. But that happens in the body of Christ. There's literally been jokes at conferences when you have multitudes of speakers. Oh, great, I have to preach after him. And I remember that one time uh, singing after this one trained voice uh, sang, and I was number two on the thing. I had to sing after this girl, and I went to the bathroom, and I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, I don't want to do this. Have you ever been there where you're just... uh, You're just sizing yourself up and you're just going, oh, I don't know. And it's like, who is this about anyways? Amen? But just to get in on that about what, I don't care if it's putting your bathing suit on and thinking, oh, no, here comes bathing suit season. Oh, great, so-and-so's. You know, we can just be terrible at ourselves. So we're just putting it out there. Maybe it's different for you guys. It's not your bathing suit. It's about the car you drive or whatever. Oh, my truck is bigger than his truck. Wait till he sees my truck. However it is, we are, we are prone. Amen. We can be prone. Amen. And you're laughing, so I'm very relieved that you're aware of that esteeming of that old ego. And it's like none of that. If we want to see the power and the move of God's Holy Spirit, we can't have that. And so we constantly going to wipe our slate clean, examine our heart, say, God, that's not right. I repent of that. I'm putting that in Jesus' mighty name. So not esteeming our ego, but esteeming and exalting and magnifying Jesus. Remember who this is all about. Amen. God was moving in a powerful way. And next is the... Fear of the Lord will eventually expose everyone's heart. So I love this scripture, and I just encourage you to live there. It's like, confess your faults to one another so that you could be healed. Let's just keep it all out in the open. Isn't that a safe place to be? Grace and I learned that years ago. If something cropped up in my heart, I'd just blab it to my friend. Blah. And then the enemy just loses. He loses right there and then. You wouldn't believe what I was wrestling with. Or you wouldn't believe what I was struggling with. Oh, brother. Oh. And then you just encourage and you just get that out of the way. But eventually, Holy Spirit, when he's moving, eventually he's going to expose everybody's heart. So why don't we just get it all out in the open? That's why I love altar time. We get to pray with one another. And when your faith is down in a certain area, let me pray for you. Amen? Because we know Holy Spirit's going to go there. He wants to go there because he wants, he's holy. So he just wants us to keep under that cleansing spout. Amen? Just keep there. Just get, keep washing your heart. Amen? And the fear of the Lord keeps us from evil. In Proverbs 16, again, I, verse 6, I wanted to go there. Proverbs 16, 6. I'll tell you, this thing kept getting bigger and bigger, the fear of the Lord. I'm going, this is so beautiful. So here we go. The Lord detests all those who are proud of heart. Be sure of this, they will not go unpunished. Through love and faithfulness, sin is atoned for. Through the fear of the Lord, evil is avoided. Isn't that beautiful? Through the fear of the Lord, evil is avoided. You're just not going to go there because of the fear of the Lord. And God detests. And he's saying, 
it's going to be punished. So eventually, uh, God is going to expose those things, and we depart from those evil. It keeps us, as well, from the entrapment of the fear of man. What does so-and-so think? Here they were, the fear of man or the fear of God. You can't, it's one or the other, isn't it? Fear of what other people will think or Lord as long as I please you that's all that matters the fear of God or the fear of man and we can't be limping between two opinions we either care more about what somebody thinks of us or we say God I care what you think and doesn't matter what it looks like on the outside amen I remember this one Sunday driving out of this parking lot and thinking oh you know, just get the whip out on the way home. And, and the Lord said, Anita, do you take the credit for when things go really, really well? And I said, no, Lord, of course not. I know it's all you. He says, well, then don't take the blame when it's going, when it doesn't look like it's going good. So, again, who are we trying to please? Is it, is it God? Have I done my ultimate with what he gave me? And I'm going to be a good steward of that. And I want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Have I got the fear of the Lord here and care more about the what he thinks, or is it the fear of man? Then we will be tested on that, believe me, over and over and over again. And, and so again, it's those wonderful boundary lines. Who is this about? Amen. And the entrapment of idolatry. What is idolatry? Have no other idols before them. And so it's exaggeration of the gift. So what did Ananias and Sapphira did? Is this the amount? Yeah, they exaggerated it. And you know, in my circles, and I've seen some things over the years, and they used to literally call things evangelically speaking, which is horrible. What a horrible using a... And that meant they were probably exaggerating. And I remember this one poster with this evangelist that we were going out to Africa and India, and, and I started to notice Fine Nemo. You know that. It's like there's the same guy, there's the same guy. So they did cut and paste to make these crowds look really, really big until we actually went on a trip, and it was like, it was wonderful. There were thousands of people there, but not tens of thousands. And I remember being appalled, like, but that's wrong, and it is wrong. We never have to exaggerate what God is doing. Amen. What he does is wonderful enough. And if we're faithful with little, he'll give us some more. But that temptation to exaggerate, exaggerate your gift or whatever, um, so that's an entrapment. All these are entrapments, and it all comes down to, you don't have to worry about that if you've got a good, healthy fear of the Lord. Amen. And then I want to go to Proverbs 14, 27. 14, 27. Thank you, Jesus. This is so good, too. Whoever, oh, I'll start verse 26, because it, it says, whoever fears the Lord has a secure fortress, and their children, and for their children it will be a refuge. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life, turning a person from the snares of death. So when you see it in that light, God is keeping you from the snares of death when we have a fear of the Lord. It's not because he's, oh, better be afraid of God. It's like, no, he's trying to save you from some trouble. Amen. The results. So many times people blame God. They call things acts of God and all kinds of things. And a lot of times they're just consequences for overstepping the boundaries and getting outside of God's will. And then they face the consequences and then they blame God. But it says, fear of the Lord is a is a is a secure fortress for your family because you don't have to worry about the enemy's attack you stay in the secret place under a shadow then we can say 
He's my refuge. He's my strength. He's my God in whom I trust. Surely he'll save us from every foul or snare. We've got a fortress. We're safe in that fortress. Amen. And it's going to keep us from the snares of death. And it's a fountain. Think of a fountain. Fountain of living water. Just fresh, clean, safe to drink. You know, in our country, we just take that so for granted. We just turn on the water. We never worry. Is the water safe? The water's safe. But when you're going to India and Africa and a lot of other places, a lot of other places, it's like, do not drink this water. But the water of the well, the Holy Spirit, the fear of the Lord is safe. It's fresh. It's alive. It's life-giving. It's refreshing. Amen? I don't have to worry about, uh, about what's happening here. I know we're in the center of God's will. If the fear of the Lord keeps us out of that entrapment of sin, of personal sin, of, of any sin against my brother or sister, it's like, that's going to keep me, and it's going to be a fountain of life because there's, it's pure. Amen. We're, we're working down here. This is, um, it, there was amazing a lot of uh, what the Word of God said about the fear of the Lord. And again, it keeps us, it gives us that hunger and that thirst for more of Jesus because Jesus delighted in that fear of the Lord. So if we want to experience the whole book of Acts, how many want to? I'm so hungry and thirsty and anticipating, and I just go, if we have the fear of the Lord, we don't have legalism and we don't, and we don't have, uh, you know, a, a wrong image of of the fear of the goodness of God, but we walk in that way, we can just be confident. We can just be confident of the signs and the wonders. It's all in the fullness of the Spirit of the Lord that was on Jesus. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. What was he saying? Spirit of wisdom and insight and understanding, knowledge and counsel and power and the fear of the Lord. And he delighted in them. So we want more of Jesus. We want to see more of what he does. We want to see the book of Acts again. How our churches in Canada need to see the power again. So we need to get a good handle on this. Amen? Because it's that fountain. And it's going to keep us. It's going to, as we embrace the entirety of what God is doing and saying, is all in the fear of the Lord. And uh, it also keeps us from uh, the where did I just go here external attacks how many are aware there's external attacks what's happening politically what's happening is like can you really trust anything that's happening or that the news says is this really true is that true it's like there's so many external attacks of the enemy the enemy knows his time is short it's getting really scary and terrible to even send your kids out to go to school or anything because of what they're shoving down their throats. It has gotten to where it's like, can you believe we're hearing this? And some places are passing that it's legal to kill a baby a, a, a month now after they're born because it takes that amount of time to find out there might be something wrong with this baby. So it's like, can the enemy get any more horrible? So we have lots of external attacks. But in this way, the, re the reason it was so dangerous is because the enemy had moved on the inside. Now it was internally in the church. And it would erect everything. Can you imagine if they just ignored this or said, that's okay, we understand. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, Ananias, that's okay. Just, we won't just tell anybody. No, it's like then the enemies moved on the inside and everything would have stopped. The signs and the wonders. So I need to ask myself, we need to ask ourselves, or maybe we are not seeing what they saw and what we long to see because we're missing. We're not embracing the fear of the Lord. And when you bring anything into the light of the fear of the Lord, you realize something stinky about that. Right? When you bring anything in, when you excuse anything, it's like, okay, what do you think about that, Lord? And so we want to bring everything into the presence of the Lord. 
which brings us full circle. It makes you want to examine your heart. And so, again, why was that so important for the effectiveness of evangelism? That would have ruined everything. So we see here, what happened is great fear fell on people. I wanted to end with that verse because it's both the good news and the bad news, again, which is a good balance. It's like no one dared come into their midst with an insincere attitude. But also the word of God increased and many people gave, put their faith in the Lord. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. So the effectiveness of the gospel is so important to have the fear of the Lord. If we want to see uh, the gospel spread, if we want to see this is good news, if they want to see God is in the midst of them, if we don't want insincerity and we won't, don't want to be polluted, we need... Uh, we need the fear of the Lord. That's about, that's about it for this morning, about the fear of the Lord. I want to be able to pray. Thank you. I want to be able to pray. Because if we bring everything, every one of our circumstances, not just financial, because I don't believe this is about just finances. I believe it affects Instead of worrying what people think, and as long as everybody has a good impression that, you know, you're doing the right thing, but when we ask the Lord, Lord, what do you think about this? It puts it in his light. And then we get holiness, because remember, it's because of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And he wants to help us, and he wants to show his power. But if his power really showed up, would some of us get zapped? I don't know. I don't want to experiment. <laughs> Here, I'll be the experiment. I just want to make sure. Amen. I believe some people are being exposed. I think that's why a few people have been exposed in a while because they've just ignored and they haven't had the fear of the Lord and God wants to make an example of them to say, don't you even think about it. Amen? So what does Holy Spirit want to do? Are we limiting God because we've already made up our mind or whatever? Bring everything. Bring it into the light and ask Holy Spirit. And that's why we have altar time. And you know, that is so powerful, and I want to just encourage that every week. Some weeks will be powerful. You've got to receive. But other times, it'll be God will move on you to pray for somebody else. How many people here have been blessed just because they went forward? Whether it be you got to pray for somebody or you got prayed for. Amen? And so... That's an opportunity. And when you have a real full service with everything in there, everything included, it's kind of absurd not to end with altar time. That's like giving nobody the opportunity to respond to what they just heard. So I'm going to invite you to come. And I believe some of our perspectives on situations that God is going to bring healing into that by bringing a bit of the fear of the Lord into that. So yesterday I had a situation and Holy Ghost uh, spoke to me and said, Proverbs, was it 24, hun? And you said, I read that one this morning. And it was like, uh, rescue those who are running headlong into disaster. Save them from stumbling. If you say, we knew nothing about that. And so, you know, there's an other situation where we just go, oh, you can see something clearly, but you don't really want to say. And I feel like God is, is he wants to speak into areas like that. Where, where he says, no, I'm putting that on you. Rescue those who are stumbling. They're, they're running headlong in the wrong way, and you don't even love them enough to tell them and to warn them because you're so concerned about what that repercussion might come on you or whatever. And so that was just one personal example. Uh, so I want to just invite the praise team, or we can put some background music on and um, whatever you have, Lisa. And can we just all gather? We just get so used to being like that because we're just family, right? Isn't that how Lisa started the service? Because we're just, we're family. Amen. 
family gets to see you in your cutoffs and you're just as you are. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on up. I'm going to wait till you're all up.